The hallmark symptom of eosinophilic esophagitis is trouble swallowing food. Let's discuss the procedures that help manage that symptom when medications alone are not helping. The first procedure that we perform to help patients improve their swallowing is an endoscopic dilatation. Patients want to know, what is that? We have a couple of techniques to open up the esophagus, and we choose that based on whether we see a distinct ring that needs to be opened up or if there's a longer segment. One is to use a balloon, which is attached to a pressure device. And this allows us to blow that balloon up to a specific pressure, which causes the balloon to open up to a certain size, and that is gonna force the esophagus open. The actual balloon looks like this. It's on a thin wire that we introduce through the endoscope. What's really helpful about this technique is that the balloon is clear, and so as it expands open, I'm able to actually see through it and see the effect that it's having on the esophagus tissue. My second method is to introduce a guide wire once we're down in the patient's stomach. The tip of it is soft and flexible, and that's left in the stomach as the scope is drawn back out of the patient. I then use that guide wire like a railroad track to introduce a dilator device. That dilator is a long silicone tube that we lubricate before we insert it into the patient's mouth. And some of you may be getting a visual of what this looks like. I didn't bring the prop because this is a family channel. So that's what an endoscopic dilatation is. Why do you need to have one? If you have severe eosinophilic esophagitis, you likely have a lot of scar that has narrowed the esophagus down as small as six or seven millimeters. That's so small that it can be difficult for a pee to pass, and that's why patients have such trouble swallowing. To swallow most foods, your esophagus needs to be at least 13 millimeters, and a normal esophagus is near 18. For comparison, that's like the size of a penny or a man's wedding ring. So what's the goal of an endoscopic dilatation? When I'm performing one, I'm gonna try to get a person's esophagus three millimeters wider than it started. That's a good stretch, one that's not gonna risk that the esophagus actually tears open and causes a perforation, which is the most feared complication of this procedure. When you understand that, you understand the answer to the patient's next question. Why do I have to have this again and again? Well, if you're starting with an esophagus that's only eight millimeters, then the most I can safely get you to in the first session is 11. And from there, we're gonna try towards 14 and then up towards 17 and maybe push it to 18 on that last session. But if I went straight to 18 from the beginning, we'd be having a very high risk of a perforation and a lot of chest pain after the procedure. So making small incremental stretches is the safest way to go and ensures patients comfort after. At times when I'm performing a dilatation, not only will I try to open the esophagus, but I'll inject some steroids into the areas of the esophagus that have opened up. And that ensures that there's healing without scarring. Hopefully that's the worst it ever gets for your eosinophilic esophagitis, but you may have a food impaction when food gets stuck in the esophagus, unable to continue down at the stomach, unable to be regurgitated back up. And that's a very painful condition that drives people to the emergency room. And that's when we need to perform our second procedure, which is a food disimpaction. During a food disimpaction, we perform an endoscopy to enter the esophagus and remove food with specialized equipment. As I discussed in another video, I'll often at that time also perform an endoscopic dilatation. And hopefully that's the worst to get. But if it gets worse, you could have a perforation, which is there's actual tear of the esophagus. It used to be that we had to perform surgery in order to fix that, but now with the advancement of endoscopic stenting, we can perform our third procedure, which is to do an endoscopy where we place a stent into the esophagus. That seals off that leak, stops the risk of infection spreading from the esophagus into the chest, and provides a scaffold for the esophagus to heal on. And hopefully that's the worst it gets. But at times, eosinophilic esophagitis can completely ruin the esophagus to where it's essentially unusable. And in those cases, a patient may need their nutrition delivered through a feeding tube. It's called a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube, or commonly called a pig tube. We perform an endoscopy and we find a good location that we can enter from the skin into the stomach and then place the tube. Not only can this be helpful for a person to have nutrition, but some people find that this is helpful to pursue a elimination diet to the extreme. That's called an elemental diet. This completely excludes all food proteins and replaces it with just the basic bare bones of amino acids and the necessary vitamins, minerals, sugars and fats. People find that really difficult to drink, and so some patients will elect to be on that diet with a feeding tube. That also helps to have them completely bypass the esophagus so it gets rest and heals. And that can be a way sometimes to get eosinophilic esophagitis back under control. With all of these procedures, we want to ensure your comfort so you'll be able to sleep under anesthesia. After these procedures, you may have some discomfort. 
It hurts to have your esophagus open. It can be difficult to have a newly placed stent. But those pains are usually pretty self-limited, and people get advancement of their food after, which they overall find an improvement of their quality of life. I hope that you found this information helpful. We bring up a lot of specific procedures, and if you have questions, I encourage you that you ask your GI provider. Thank you for your time, and be safe.